Hey guys, it's Robert Gardner here with Susan Salvo. I am salivating at the thought of this conversation. It's going to be really interesting. Susan has a different perspective on uh, pain management, which we're going to talk about, and also perception of massage. And Susan, can you uh, introduce yourself briefly and also just give people an idea of where they can find you online, like if you're on Facebook or Instagram? Okay. Uh, my name is Susan Salvo, and um, I am on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. And I have a blog called Massage Passport. Um, I had a website, but it got stolen from me. There's a whole other story. We'll, we'll go into that later. So the best way to, to find me through a website is my, I have one called Massage Passport, www.massagepassport.com. Uh, massage therapist of 40 years, uh, love massage therapy. I started writing textbooks about 30 years ago. Teach wow. at massage schools. I teach at three massage schools right now. Uh, work as uh, an author and expert witness in legal cases, which hopefully we'll talk a little bit about that. And um, just love seeing you at conferences, Robert. And I'm really glad that you <laughs> finally asked me. Oh, my God. I'm salivating to get on this program. <laughs> I'm, I'm always surprised when they still invite me to a conference. <laughs> so let's... Uh, Talk about what you want to talk about first. Um, you talked about like pain management, but what's really uh, getting at you that you want to discuss? I guess it's the whole idea about what pain really is and what's the best way that we can serve our clients. Uh, I, as you know, the last 40 years, we've seen a whole shift in how pain is thought about, even yeah. how massage fits in that profile. Uh, I was lucky in early in my career uh, I loved energy work and um, there was a lot of criticism about it and I, I chanced upon uh, Traeger, Milton Traeger's work in the 1980s and I loved his approach because he was so ahead of his time. He took an educational approach to massage so when you get, when, you go, when you're on the table you come to absorb a lesson uh, and not receive a session so it's not, it's very active, not passive the massage is. And he also worked, he, we didn't call it neuroplasticity then, but that's exactly what he was doing. He was using something called novel movements, which is another buzzword we hear a lot in massage right now, that you can be different because you've experienced something different. So his is uh, reprogramming the mind so the, the person, the client, can have a different opinion about a movement or a different opinion about their body. And this is really where, where we've headed. Uh, as a uh, as pain science and pain theories and neurobiology and massage, we're no longer looking at, at massage from a it affects circulation standpoint, but we're, we're really reprogramming the body thinks about itself. Traeger used to say, "I don't care about the body; I care what's going on between the right and the left ear," and that's what he tries to approach, and that is what I feel like we as massage therapists are doing. With our with our sounds, with our movements, with our you know smell, the whole sensory experience, and there's been a big shift in a concept called introception. Now, well, I'm going to move quickly from pain management to uh, offshoots of pain management, which is things like depression and anxiety, and those dovetail in together when you look at massage, pain, and mood disorders, mental disorders through the lens of uh, introception. And that's where I see uh, massage does its magic. And um, so I'm just a big, big fan of massage and how it can help people. And again, we need to reduce barriers to get people on our table. Or Matt. <laughs> Thank you. Or Matt. No, I'm, just I'm totally teasing, by the way. Yeah. No, I, I think that, in fact, there was there's a lot of shifts going on to the profession. And uh, we had a, a student go through the massage program about a year ago, and his business name was Table or Matt. Yeah. So yeah, I completely agree with that. I have a, an interesting perspective of education and massage because after core curriculum, um, I went to a Steiner school in Pennsylvania. I'm now working in CE uh, education, not in primary, like in school education. So I feel sort of removed from core curriculum and I'm sort of adding to students' education after school. 
So it's hard for me to get my finger on the pulse of like what's going on, especially across 50 different states. I do know that trying to address components of pain science in my own curriculum is really challenging for students. And I'm not exactly sure what students are being taught. Like if they think that, for instance, they're actually doing stuff to the forearm extensors, the muscles themselves, or whether they're thinking they're affecting like cutaneous and subcutaneous nerves. I don't make a big fuss about it in my curriculum, but as students start asking questions about um, a specific technique, and I have to point this out to them, they're like, well, you, you teach mobilization and you teach stretching and you teach this compression sometimes with shear and then there's like ischemic compression, like which one is the right technique? And I go, the technique that Susan responds to. Oh. Yeah, I agree with that. In fact, what one of the things that they did was on the measures of pain management, I'm sorry, uh, reduction of pain and, and proof function. Those were the two things they were looking at. They actually tried to compare different types of massage. And they found that there really is no significant difference. None. It really is, like you said, is you have to really listen to the client and find out what they, they, they and their body responds to. But this is why we have to give therapists a big toolbox, which cannot be completely taught well at entry level. No, so yeah, think, that, that is one that I talk about. They'll think I have this animosity towards schools, and I'm like, no, they've only got 500 hours. Yeah. They can't yeah. teach you marketing on TikTok. That's right. <laughs> they're, they're busy. That's right. <laughs> but, and, but you all, you really need that work experience before you can even really fully appreciate uh, a CE class. Um, I, one of my professors at, I went to the New Mexico School of Natural Therapeutics in Albuquerque, and Carol Kresge, my massage teacher, said it took me one year to build my business at four years to know what I was doing. And I completely say you really do need that tincture of time. Uh, to really fully appreciate and integrate the information that you get in massage school before you can really tackle, wrap your head around a CE class. And I'll tell you what else I believe in. Don't take one CE class and consider yourself done in that modality. Because I've taken anatomy now six different times. The last time, two years ago, when I took my yoga teacher training. And I'm a different person. So I hear anatomy different now than I did 40 years ago. So I do believe in, in if you're really passionate about a modality or a topic, you need to keep re-educating yourself, not from only in the same uh, concepts, but with different teachers, because they'll give you a different spin on it. So um, I often tell uh, students, don't just go for the modality, go for the instructor. I, a big part of, I, I did a training uh, yesterday with a new student, and their model came in, uh, a guy named John, and and John, started, the the student started to work on John, and John cursed, and he's like, "Oh, I'm sorry," because we were recording the session, and I was like, "Huh?" And he's like, "Well, I don't I don't want to curse," and I'm like, "Oh no, when you curse, that takes pressure off of me." <laughs> they can they I can be like, oh, "I can't control John," you know. The difference is trying to encourage students to do something new or something different. Um, outside of the box and then my work being primarily mat based which is what this student was trying to learn she's an adept massage therapist working on a table using her hands and arms she was having a little bit of a challenge and I was like hey you're totally fine where you are you have to understand I've been using my legs and feet for 20 years my practice is fully mat based I don't remember a time when I couldn't use my legs and feet not only is the interaction with the client different where the client is communicating and cursing, <laughs> but you're using your body in a way that you're not familiar with. It's totally normal to feel, frankly, like a novice. Yeah. Being able to create a situation where like my work is very, um, it can have like deep compressions. For me, I sometimes tell the students to go take something else like cranial sacral therapy, something light. Because they think my work is like removed from that, like it's deep, deep compressions. And it's like, no, I spend almost as just as much time doing stuff like this and going, hey, if I shear more out towards the ulna or the radius. But I don't think it's uh, massively visually stimulating on camera. Ah, yeah. And I'll tell you, things like Traeger is 
so visual, but it's almost deceptive because going back to kind of what you're saying, and we're saying the same thing, but on different ends of the spectrum, mm -hmm. because when you watch Traeger, it looks brutal, but it's one of the most gentle things you can ever experience because it almost feels like you're rocking yeah. and you kind of, you have to psychologically um, done with not done to, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the client has to relax, trust and let go for things to start happening. And so sometimes it's just the attitude that you bring to the table or the mat that allows the client to relax. Um, so I completely agree with you. I think that, I think that you need that, that shift and not to trust the camera all the time because you can't see what's going on inside the client's body. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll verbally, because I teach on camera a lot, so I will verbally say, this is what I'm doing, this is where I'm shearing. But there are times when even as close as the camera is, it's almost imperceptible, but you can hear the client go, oh. Yeah. And the students will kind of go, well, how did you know? And I'm like, I communicated with the client. And a, a big deal that I've had over time is students will come out of massage school and there's a little bit of this. They're taught to be a service provider. Mm -hmm. And then I go, but we're going to, we're going to have to communicate with them to solve problems. If we're going to do pain management, we got to communicate with them verbally more than maybe what you're familiar with in school. And I think some of those tweaks on a formula, like it's very confusing to the student because they're not used to being um, verbal with the client about what they're feeling as they're feeling it. Yeah. 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 And I will tell you, this is one of my big um, ideas. It's not my ideas. It's been out there a while, but it's very popular. It's a, it's a tiered system. And to where you give the students some universal core information, cut them loose for a while, let them go develop some skills, and then come back to school for a second tier. And that's when you can kind of layer on some of these concepts. Some students are ready for it in entry level. Um, but I would say over half are not. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but this is why I think we need to have entry level education um, very uh, very lean and just very almost like introductory yeah. and then go into the different models and um, and levels of expertise later. Even even if you look at Bruner's novice to expert theory, there are five stages yeah. and um, competency is only the middle stage. Then you get to proficiency and, and, and then expertise. Um, but um, but I, I had do somebody look at my curriculum and they went. So you just expect massage therapists to watch video of you working and replicate what you're doing? And I go, ah, that's pretty much my whole business model. <laughs> now, and there's nothing it's a, wrong with that. Yeah. It, it does, because it's so non-traditional, though, and that's kind of one of my things I wanted to share with, with reducing barriers. We yeah. have to give students more uh, freedom to choose their own instructional model because your the videos may be completely sufficient but even though it's not traditional education uh in the way that we think about classroom and hour and that's the whole thing too with with um entry-level education the way it's taught now it's taught on a, a clock based hourly i'm going to call it butt in the seat because that's what whitney Lowe always, always uses uh model of education and it, it's not always um sufficient uh, because it's not based on competency and that's co sounds like what your approach is i mean I, I don't know i you know i don't know uh as much about education itself i kind of i wanted to teach what i was doing so i had to get involved in education and then i don't have a lot of background in like educational theory as a former philosophy student um the students would ask how i learned and i said the student had a question i would answer if they had the same question, I knew they didn't get it. I'd tweak it and tweak it and tweak it. Most of what I did with digital stuff was mostly designed as supplementation. It wasn't designed to get rid of hands-on instruction, but once you'd had some hands-on instruction, like even in massage school, why couldn't, I mean, I work with people close on, so why couldn't you just heavily supplement in video? 
Because it seems like that's a, a benefit to having it available. Yeah. And that's very, um, uh, what's the word, Socratic model. Uh, before we had curriculum, this is the way you taught, was this, you had to have a question first in the student's mind. The and student, then you met that. The student came in yesterday, and I, I had to sit back, and I knew. I'm like, Robert, you've been working with some students for six years. This young lady has never taken an in-person class with you. You have to start over. Like, I was just aware of this. And she came in, and I said, what do you want to work on? And she's like, well, I don't, I don't know. And here's the thing. I go, listen, long term, if you ask me a question, I'm going to answer. And your questions are going to let me know where you're at so I can keep filling in the gaps. I was like, I work with students who have a yoga background, a martial arts background, they're a personal trainer, they're a yoga teacher, they're a massage therapist. They've already been doing some mat-based work. I, I get people all over the map. If you don't ask questions, I'm going to have to teach like you've never done anything on a mat to help anybody in pain ever. Yeah, but you meet them where they are, which is a yes. skill set in and of itself as a I teacher. Mean, I mean, we expect our uh, massage therapists to do it with our clients, but it's so hard. We want to insert our own agenda. Yeah. And, and that's, that's, that's a trap. Im improvisation is where I shine. Literally, <laughs> it's like throw me in a room and go, what are you having problems with? Let's work on it. What are you having yeah. problems with? Let's work on it. You need education? Cool. What do you need? I, yeah. I work best in that way, and I've had to write curriculum, and this is what always kills because she came in, and I said, I wrote 700 pages of sequence manuals and nine DVDs of core content to get you started. I was like, have I you read or watched any of that? And she's like, no, I, I didn't know I was supposed to. And I go, no, 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 you don't have to. I just wrote it. There's another thousand hours in my, my video vault. Have you watched any of that? And she's like, no, I didn't know that. I'm like, no, you don't have to. I just don't know where people are. As far as supplementation goes, I'm, I've been heavy in the last like six years. <laughs> like, there's no shortage. I'm overwhelming students, and it also happens just in video form. Yeah. So how do you teach pain management? I teach students to communicate with clients and make eye contact first. And they go, this is crazy. I just don't. He just wants me to communicate with the client. And I go, this is what happened online. They go, well, they'd come in and ask a question, which I'm encouraging. And they'd say, my client has shoulder pain. What do I do for shoulder pain? And I said, okay, where does the client have shoulder pain? And they're like, well, I don't know. And I go, guys, I can teach you a sequence on the shoulder, which means I will have to cover every muscle that crosses the shoulder joint, which means I need about 30 hours to teach that class. What? But I just want to work on their shoulder. And I go, then I have to cover the tissue that crosses the shoulder joint. And then I have to talk about the brachial plexus and nerves. You know, it's like... They were like, oh, I just wanted to help them with their shoulder pain. And I go, they don't understand the depths of like the question they're asking. If they can tell me where the person is having shoulder pain, I might be able to narrow it down faster. But teaching problem solving is very challenging. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you look at it from that neurological lens for pain management, maybe it's not the muscles at all. You've got to communicate with the client. You've got to give them a new experience with their body. Um, it's just a whole different way of looking at things. So I think we uh, just lost massage therapists. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, 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 no. No, I disagree because what? Because what? What? Okay, so education is a behavioral science. Do you agree with that? Sure. Okay. Because of what Milton Traeger did, and other people, he isn't the only one is that we are now looking at massage therapy through the lens of behavioral science. So everything you're saying is completely in alignment with that. It's less about the biology and uh, physiology and more about the psychology of it. People, okay, so people say, oh, Susan, what are the, your CE classes you've taken in the last 40 years? What, have, what has really been transformational? 
for me, number one, it was Traeger. It completely shifted my focus on everything I was taught in massage school. Number two, it was a technique called Hakomi because it was body-centered psychotherapy. That's the second one. The third one was infant massage training because you had to learn to work with people non-verbally. And I know your verbal skills are very, very important, but there's probably a whole other layer of that we haven't even talked about yet, uh, which is the non-verbal cues. And it also taught me how to be an instructor and to work with parents who often had special needs children and that whole facilitating as opposed to being a therapist. Because oftentimes that's what we're doing is being, being a facilitator. And that's what a good educator is, I think. And you, you just kind of said it with your model. That's being a facilitator. Or a, uh, one of my favorite terms is a, a cognitive apprentice, getting to, them to think a little bit more. Ooh. Yeah, I, so I, I, I'm, I'm brutal because I had a philosophy background and I have I had to learn if I answer students' questions with a question, they get angry. Not all students. And you can, you can get them to unplug from that. And, and by the end of a semester, and I love your teaching style. I, I think I have a lot of the characteristics. They get mad at first. See, and that's, that's where we're a little bit different because I follow them through 500 to 900 hours and I watch the transformation over time. So if they stick with me yeah, and they can, they can be, they're okay with being uncomfortable yeah. mentally. I the, think I can get them there. The feedback loop. And I did not realize this until COVID COVID uh, shifted the business model. And I was already teaching online, but I needed more and I had the time, of course, to be able to, to delve. And after a period of time, I wound up from four camera angles with a keypad switcher. I could flip camera angles live. And I'm like, oh my God, you just created a completely new business. Like nobody's going to understand this for years. Like you can interact live inside Zoom, four camera angles, show them what you're doing, watch them, give feedback. The only thing you can't feel is the touch itself. And then what I noticed was there was like this interesting bifurcation, this split, because people wanted hands on, but I'm like, guys, it's a global pandemic. Like, let me supplement as heavy, heavily as I can online. And it's created this interesting thing because one of the things I realized about my perspective of education based in CE classes was there was a lack of a feedback loop. Unless the student took a class and kept coming back, it was yeah. like one and done. Yeah, you're you right. never You never got to see it develop. You never got to see it change. The students are taking my class like it's another massage class instead of a completely different discipline. And they'll talk about it and I say, listen, you went to massage school for 500 hours. Why don't you give me 500 hours? And they're like, that's, that's ridiculous. And I'm like, really? To teach you a completely new discipline on a mat using your legs and feet, suspension and abdominal work with yoga therapy? And wow. they're like, what? And I'm like, we're not done. This, this little two-day class was to get you started. What started to happen to me through the cameras was the feedback loop. Yeah. The students would come back month after month with new questions and then I kept filling in the gap and I realized for me there had been a, a, a gap in terms of feedback loop because yeah. as a CE provider they would take like a three-day class and I would never see them again. Yeah. And it's actually a very educational, I, my doctorate is in education, it's kind of my wheelhouse. That's actually a very educational sound concept to have that because it's called immediate feedback and that's how, how you uh, make mistakes and correct mistakes and then take it to a higher level. Um, when, when I talk about my Traeger training, I think one of the reasons why I loved it so much was because they set up the training track is what they called it to where you took a seven day intensive and then you said goodbye and you had to document like a hundred sessions. You came back only when you were ready. Only, I'm sorry. I had to fulfill that criteria. And then you took another three or four or five day class and then you say he let you go again and you came back and each time it was richer and, and, and just, and the learning you could, you could do so much in three or five days because you had, 
you know, the table work under your belt. We didn't have the videos back then. That's a great supplement. And, um, and, the, and the intensive of the CE class with the instructors and lots of other uh, TAs. I'm sure you use TA. I'm, I'm saying that. Do you use TAs when you teach? Yeah. Uh, mainly because they run interference. Because so I come in very masculine and gruff, asking questions, trying to crack their ego open. And then Kristen and Danielle come in very feminine and nice and say things in a nice way. And they're like, don't listen to Robert. He just, you know, he's just got an, he's, he's a good teacher. He just got a bad attitude. And it's more to me, it's not just the information delivered. It's also, I think, a matter of representation because 85% or so of the massage industry is women. They don't really want to hear a guy question their industry. When Kristen and Danielle do it as, as teaching assistants, it kind of opens it up to where they, they resonate with the instructor more that way. That's interesting, yeah. brilliant, and strategic on your part. Mindful. Uh, I, had, I had somebody tell me once, and this is a business thing, because people have certain gifts, and I had a, a student one time, she said, Robert, what is up with your teaching assistants? And I was like, what do you mean? And she's like, it's like the Rainbow Coalition. She's like, Michael is, is a gay man who is half black, half Korean. I'm half Thai, half white and do CrossFit. Danielle and Kristen and who, like, you just have people all over. And I'm like, oh, well, part of it is like, can they support the curriculum? And then can they also reference it from a different vantage point? Not everybody wants to study with me specifically. Yeah. Yeah. They balance me. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but one of the things I like to do when I teach about pain management is I do like to go back and talk about the history of pain theories. So I go back way back, you know, when they used to think pain was because of you sinned and then go back and, uh, and talk about uh, the gate theory and then on to the neuromatrix model, which is kind of where we're at right now, into the biopsychosocial model. And now we've actually shipped, made a shift to the biopsychosocial spiritual model because they found out the biopsychosocial model didn't fit in hospice. So, um, so it's just kind of fun to watch the evolution and it gives people uh, the vision that it will evolve over time. So don't get too comfortable in the model right now because sure enough, in the next you know, 10, 20 years, we'll have another uh, shift in consciousness. And we'll be looking at things differently. Not that our tools are going to change. And that's the thing that uh, I know you had uh, Christy on your podcast recently. She's a, a student of mine and friend of mine. And when she took, a, I won't say the modality, but she took a modality and she says, oh my God, Susan, this is terrible. I just took this modality. And uh, they're, they're, they've got all this debunking going on. And I said, Christy, that's fine. That's fine. It's the theory that's changed, not the technique. Yeah. And it was like, she was like, oh. yeah. So uh, I had to remind students it's not our so understanding that's changing, not the techniques themselves. We've been doing these techniques, you know, traditionally for millennia. So be okay with learning the techniques, just do them well. To me, it's kind of like if I was going to teach somebody to play basketball, would I give them a rule book? Probably or would not. I just say, hey, come on, let's go play basketball. And then you're yeah. like, I can't dribble. I can't, like, okay, I can't dribble and move. And then, like, okay, so just stand still and shoot. And it's like, oh, you missed. Okay, shoot again. Yeah. It's like, the way you learn to do body work is by doing body work. And I'd hate to say doing it poorly at first. The give and receive process gives you a little bit more of a sense of flow over your body. And I taught... Uh, in my workbooks and DVDs, sequences. And this always blew my mind because they were treating the sequence like it was a magical artifact. You had to do the sequence the, rate, the way the sequence was written. And well, then but I they would, go to the, the novice expert theory, and, yeah. and students generally go from rule-driven to principle-driven. Yeah. So you, they do need to, to understand the mechanics before they can transcend it. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's just a natural progression, I think. I, I would take them in a class and lead them through the sequence. And then I'd watch a student and I'd go, mm, hey, hold on, let's show you a different version of this. Do you have a problem with your hip on the right side? And they're like, yeah, how did you know? I'm like, oh, I can just tell by the way you're moving. Um, 
let's uh, change this and let's have you do it this way. And they were like, whoa, there's like more than one way to do it? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, uh, there's about 20. Like, we have to make the practice fit your body, not make your body just fit the practice. Yeah. But that and, takes a lot of self-awareness. And that's one yeah. thing that you have to teach as well. No, I give up. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, don't. Don't give up. <laughs> it's like, oh, no, I got to teach classes on what self-awareness now. Oh, I thought I was aging body work. Oh, Lord. Yeah, but, but it's a beautiful thing, and this is why we do have time. If they come back, if they don't quit, yeah, they come back and learn a different layer. And that's why I like the model of, like you said, the feedback model. And you're 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 a you go from being their instructor to being their mentor. Um, but I think that's a real important aspect of teaching. That, yeah, that when we that had, I like, mean, entry level. Yeah, when we had class at the AMTA, Kristen was there. And Kristen has been with me, and especially in the last two or three years, like very heavily immersed. She's starting to teach, like she's helping me as assistant more. And Kristen was like, oh my God, Robert, these people, they were freaking out at the AMTA convention. They were, oh my God, they were so excited. And she gets really pumped when the students are excited about it. And I was like, Kristen, we can't even teach those classes in Austin. And I was like, why? She's like, I, I don't know. And I go... At the AMTA convention, they're going to take a six-hour class because they're going to just do a sampler for the event. None of the courses that I taught mention the word time massage. What was it? Marketing. Carpal tunnel relief and Thai-style foot massage. Which means... Say it again? There a reason for that? I have a tendency to want to teach curriculum to solve specific problems. And the therapists just want a service that they can sell clients that's less work and makes them more money, which means the client already has to know what it is. Sometimes they don't. Ah, which is, to me, I have more more excitement. This is me. I have more excitement talking about the business than I do the body work at this point. But it's like when I talked to Kristen about it, it was like, Kristen, the reason they loved it is because they came in for carpal tunnel. And then I gave them all these crazy techniques they'd never seen, and they went, oh my God, he's using his body in this totally different way, but it's like totally saves my hands. And I go, ding. And yeah, then, but that's because you're a bodywork philosopher. Uh, I, that sounds unemployable. <laughs> it was your kids. <laughs> I, need a, I need a job. <laughs> The difference is it's a it's a packaging thing. Here in Austin, we have a class coming up for intro tie. We have signups. We have the exact same carpal tunnel class and the exact same Thai style foot massage. No one is signed up. There's 1.6 million people in the greater Austin area and just thousands of massage therapists. And Kristen's like, but I want to teach the mat. I want to teach the mat. And I go, well, where are all these advanced mat students, Kristen? She's like, oh, I'm like, Kristen, you have to create them. You have to create advanced students. You can't, like, just will them into being. But what you call it and how you package it matters. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I agree. So Sometimes I'll have uh, groups just say, this is what, this is the title we need. Can you make a class to fit it? And there's nothing wrong with that because, in a way, the convention people (laughs) <laughs> the convention people have got to create a menu that's going to appeal to a wide variety of people. So you can't fault them for that. Mm. Um, and so they're just making sure all the all the boxes are checked. And so you just happen to be, or I happen to be, one of those people. And just like you, I mean, I love the, the love the way that you said, this is what I'm doing, but I'm really teaching marketing, and this is what I'm doing, but I'm really calling it this. Um, sometimes it gets them in the door and then you can transform them with your educational style. Yeah, the, the marketing and the advertising is like my weak point. I, I can't, I cannot put my finger on the pulse of the common massage therapist in the United States to be able to build the business I want yet. Like, I just, I don't share their value system. I don't think the way they do. And quite frankly, a lot of massage therapists are put off by what I'm teaching. They're like, dude, this is not... Like, in other words, 
you're teaching this mat based discipline in a table based industry. I literally have to work completely for myself to do what you teach. And I go, exactly. Why don't you build your own practice? Oh, but that's like so much work. And I go, yes, I did it. Then I go, well, why, why doesn't a facility allow you to do what I teach? And they're like, they're not going to allow me to put in a mat. And I'm like, why? They don't want well-trained staff who can help people in pain effortlessly and charge more for the service. And what do you say about that? Uh, no, there's currently there aren't the visionaries that see the, the model. Eventually, uh, do you know who Simon Sinek is? Yeah, sure do. Yeah. Um, I watched a, 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 film, not a, not a film, I watched like a TED talk he did. And he talked about um, innovators and early adopters and then mass market saturation. Yeah. And he said that mass market saturation was 15 to 18 percent of the marketplace. Yep. And I said less than one percent of the massage marketplace is mat based. And I teach less than one percent of that one percent. That's how small it is currently. We haven't even remotely hit scale. And what massage facility says, the mat, the, oh, this is the future. This is where the industry is going. Keep their clothes on and put them on a mat. No, that's not, we're, we're way, we're not even remotely close to that. I'm still working with one student at a time, primarily. So is it closed or, or unclosed? Completely closed. Yeah. That's uh, actually one of the reasons why I learned Traeger. Because the client's closed. Yeah, like I think if uh, like you're coming from a more like old school sort of thinking in a sense. And when I say that, what I mean is do most massage, I mean, I know of Traeger and I've read like a little bit about it. Do most massage therapists coming out of school right now even know who Traeger is? No. Yeah, that, that's what I meant by it. Oh. Uh, it, yeah, it's like a different, it's a, like a different era. I had somebody at a party the other night ask me if I do rolfing. Yeah. What you do? Well, okay, but okay, but going back to uh, marketing, uh, and I'm trying. Okay, so for the record, uh, tra Traeger is a trademark term, so I can't really use it. I can't say I teach it. Uh, I teach something very Traeger-like. Yeah. And I'm calling it body mobilization techniques. I'm I got to come again. Marketing, going back to the whole concept, I got to come up with a way to teach it because I do think that with the new way we're looking at. The pain model, uh, I do think it's extremely valuable, these skills. Uh, and I can do it on a mat or I can do it on a table with the clients completely clothed. And, um, but yeah, marketing is the key. One time I called it, because technically, another another antiquated term is neuromuscular. You don't hear that term anymore. Yeah. But technically, uh, one time I taught a class in Alabama at a CE convention and I, I called it, I was, I was, I, I taught the work and I said, okay, guys, at a, at a dinner table, I said, give me the, give me a name for it. She goes, actually, it is really neuromuscular because you're focusing on the nervous system. So I said, okay, I'll call it advanced neuromuscular. People were so mad <laughs> because they were expecting the traditional neuromuscular and not what I was teaching. And so I thought maybe that was a bad idea. Yep. I mean, I, I wrote 700 pages of sequence manuals called Time Massage. Nine DVDs called Thai Massage, and people said, your work is not Thai. And I go, correct. I'm Scots-Irish ancestry. I grew up in South Louisiana, and I live in Central Texas, and I've never been to Thailand. So so what is it? That's what you're calling it? No, I'm rebranding completely. The, the students don't even under, like, the mat alone is confusing enough. I mean... I'm essentially, this is what I tell people, I'm teaching Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu to an industry full of boxers. Woo, that's deep. And they're like, what? And I'm like, come on, hit me. I dodge a punch, put them in a chokehold, bring them to the ground and say, I'm going to rip your arm off unless you tap out. It's a different art form. It's mat based. Close on. You use your legs and feet. Sometimes multiple points of contact. Now, take the, what you think of as Thai massage and blend yoga therapy and pain science in it. Now, what is that? I now call it next level pain relief. And the students are going, but this isn't, 
massage. And I go, great, we don't need licenses in all 50 states. No, but you, no. And I'm like, I didn't say it wasn't massage, you did. In other words, this service does not resemble the thing I was trained to do in school. And I'm like, well, yeah. we're, we're evolving, we're changing, that's all. That's all. Yeah. Another tool in your toolbox. I think it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. I always tell students they need to know at least one technique to do on clothed clients. So there is a huge need if you want to work with people under age uh, to to learn a safe uh, clothed massage. So that's pretty much what I'm advocating in my textbooks yeah. if you want to work with adolescents they need to be clothed yeah there's so much i had a uh, long story short um i started recording my classes because it was supplemental materials to facilitate students learning at a distance so we're supplementing the in-person class and then i realized what i was doing was so controversial in some uh in some spheres that I had recordings of everything I was teaching so students couldn't lie about what I said anymore. <laughs> uh, I was reported for teaching a class online by a young lady who lived in Arkansas. She got very angry at something I said. That she contacted TDLR and reported me from another state, mind you. And then TDLR is contacting me and like, what did you do? And I'm like, you saw what I did. She gave you a copy of the recording. And they said, well, we want to see your curriculum. And I said, here you go. Here's every class I've taught since 2017. And they went, what? And I went, I record all my classes. Here's every class I've taught since 2017. You can see my curriculum. And they went, uh, I'm like the police. I record myself. <laughs> what was the outcome of that investigation? Nothing. And you want to make it more fun? Are you ready? Yeah. I have a lawyer, and my lawyer told me this once. He said, listen, Robert, I know that you are an ethical, um, upstanding gentleman. I can tell that you have you know, legal challenges, as most growing businesses and entrepreneurs do. Um, I'm not going to give you business advice. My job is to keep you out of jail. It's like, I'm a lawyer. That's what I do. Um, you know, I, if, if business advice comes up, I may mention something, but generally, I just keep you out of jail. When, when I got reported to the state board, I never contract, contacted the lawyer, and here's why. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm the, ready. The state of Texas does not allow hands-on instruction online for CE credit. I was teaching hands-on instruction online in another state with a woman who had never met me, never had a session with me, who reported me to the state board. And I said, Mr. Lawyer, sir. If the state of Texas doesn't allow me to teach hands-on instruction online, how does anything I do on the internet have to do with the jurisdiction of TDLR? And he's like, it doesn't. I'm glad you understand law now. Nice. That was well played. Well, I mean, I answered their questions and they have to do their due diligence to make sure nothing awry is you know, going on. But it's like a, a weird regulatory environment. Um, the process with students, I can tell, is like, well, I just want my CE credit. And I'm like, wait, hold on. I can't give you CE credit in Texas unless it's theory. And they're like, what? I'm like, guys, I don't control state massage law. They did not even waive that during COVID. You still had to take an in-person class or you had to take something that was theory. That's changing. You do know that in Louisiana, which I know we're neighboring states, you can do a certain amount of hands-on online for C classes. For C classes, not in Texas, not yet. Not yet. And well, then I then I ask students. I'm like, why? Wait, 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 wait. Are you sure about that? Because they, I want to say, you can teach theory. Texas even allows some distance learning. You can teach theory. I have, okay. a so, I have a social media marketing class. You can get credit for that. You cannot teach hands-on instruction online for CE credit. And I'd ask students in an in-person class here in Texas, why is that? Why is the law written that way? And they're like, well, I don't know. And I'm like, because if the state of Texas allows me to teach hands-on instruction online for CE credit, I'll give away CE credit to every massage therapist in Texas for the rest of my life for free until I'm dead. 
I love that. Schools don't want competition. Do they want to compete with me for four camera angles on the internet? And they're like, what? And I go, the, the law is not what you think it is. Wow. Well, I do believe um, I am the optimist to think that it's going to change, mainly because higher education is doing this. Higher education is allowing a lot of hands-on skills to be taught did, um, through the internet. 75% of my current business is teaching through cameras to people in other cities and states and countries. I'm simultaneously told at the same time that I'm doing that successfully that massage therapists cannot learn online. And I go, what is online? And they're like, well, no, it's a pre-recorded. I'm like, I'm teaching people from four camera angles live. I can, I can stream to YouTube and teach 10,000 people a day. And they're like, what? And I go, I'm running four cameras at the same time. Flipping camera angles live, showing people exactly what I'm doing on a model. We can pick a new topic every day and do this two hours a day, five days a week, 52 weeks a year, and give students another 500 hours of footage every year. And they're like, what? what? And I go, you'll catch up. You'll figure it out later. It's okay. okay. It's all so, right. So in Louisiana... They just passed or will pass a law that says everything above the 500 hour uh, minimum, which is for state requirements, some schools teach up more. All of that can be done virtually. So if, if I'm, I teach at several schools, one's a 650, one's a five, and one's a 900. Yeah. And um, in, the, in those higher levels, over 500, uh, you, we could be teaching. Thai massage virtually. I'm just saying it's it's in Louisiana. It's possible. You, you talked about EdNet earlier. I've I've gone to educational forums and said, "Listen, I can stream from four camera angles to any school in America for free. Would any of you like a demo where I stream into your school and teach the students?" And there's a deafening echo. Oh. No takers. I'll take you up on that. I mean, I see the value. I see the value in that. I mean, it's it's a different it's a different business model, and I just keep doing what I do, and it's fine. I get a little frustrated sometimes, but it's it ain't grandpa's education. Let's put it that way. Like the students in my subscription are like, I don't. I don't understand. I can't watch. And I go, cool. So should I not be recording what I'm doing and documenting it? Somebody somewhere eventually can watch it and learn, right? Yeah. And, 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 and to me, Robert, what you're doing is reducing barriers. How, and, how, how about $7 a month? Wow. They're like, but education's expensive. I'm like, it's $7 a month. And they're like, but... I'm like, listen, if you're in sub-Saharan Africa and you're on a smartphone, if you can get internet access, you can study with me. You can work yeah. on people in your village. And they're like, but this is, this doesn't make sense. And I go, I, I'm not sure anymore. <laughs> when I was taking my master's level education class, online education was called on demand education that for some reason that went away but it was originally called that's really what you just described yeah. on demand education yeah the 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 industry i i think is almost like guilty sometimes of magical thinking and the individual students they always say this they say no no i want hands on and i go oh you want robert's magic touch you could, you could get that at robertsmagictouch.com. It costs a million dollars. And they're like, oh, why are you making fun of us? And I'm like, because I can stream to 10,000 of you a day for free. And they're like, what? <laughs> we'll figure it out later. Uh, people on Twitch figured out streaming a long time ago. Like, this is not a new concept. It's yeah. like if you can watch somebody play a video game, you can watch me work on clients. People I can show are you. Learning to, the woman that does my hair, yeah. she learned how to play the piano online. Mm -hmm. Hello. 
But, but I think it'll eventually happen. There's enough people oh, yeah. who, you know, saying trying to break the model that will. I think it'll eventually happen. And uh, the franchises are pushing it too. They want more. They want to expedite people getting into school and out of school so they can start working. And and you know, in whatever whatever format place that they want to. Um, I just believe going back to education. I believe in just choices having more than one educational model so people can choose what works for them. Because most people going through massage school now, Robert, are non-traditional students. Yeah. And they need these, this type of educational model that works for them. Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly not, I'm certainly not done. I, I've, it's, it's been weird. Like I get uh, mixed messages. Uh, across the industry because it's working like I'm making 75% of my revenue teaching online and then even Kristen being right near me is like well, we need in-person classes and in-person classes and in-person classes and I go Kristen where are the in-person students we we throw up a class we're in Austin we get one student from Austin three are from San Antonio one is from Oklahoma another is from Laredo like I had a student, they were like, man, there's so many people like blocking online education. Why did you decide to do online education? And I was like, because I want 0.1% of all the students in every city and state, not just the 0.1% here in Austin. And they went, oh. Yeah. And I go, why would I want to limit like access? Like I'm trying to, to blow that open. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is basically democracy of education. I mean, you, online education really levels the playing field. Yeah, I got students. They're like, "Man, you need to patent that suspension. You need to patent and patent." And I'm like, "What? You want me to patent the pair? No, get out of here! You can't patent that. That's ridiculous." And they're like, "Well, but people are going to copy your stuff." And I go, "Okay, do they have seven hundred pages of sequence manuals, nine DVDs, a thousand hours of online footage. Are they teaching for four cameras live on the internet interactively? And they're like, well, no. And I'm like, let them try to compete with me. Can they do it at $7 a month? And they're like, oh. I'm like, dude, this isn't a competition. Like, they act like if mat-based facilities sprung up out of the ether all of a sudden, it's like, great, you just made a market for me? Awesome. <laughs> It's like, this is not, I don't know, the competition, that's a, such a weird mindset to me. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. Um, but it sounds like you've got a great model. Just keep working it. I think the online education is is here, and it's go, it's here to stay, and it's just going to proliferate. I think there's going to be more and more demand for it. Uh, and and uh, like you said, COVID did flip things. The, the genie's out of the bottle, basically. It's not going back. Yeah, I don't, uh, we started looking at like 3D cameras and stuff, like stuff where you could put on a helmet and like immersively like look around the room. And I don't think we're quite there yet, but I don't, I don't really know what happens to like core curriculum specifically. Uh, core curriculum in massage schools, the way it's currently regulated state to state, I know that there is pressure from larger institutions trying to get more massage therapists more rapidly. Like, um, I've seen uh, students doing like apprenticeship regulation, yeah. uh, d you know, I mean, to try to speed up that process. Yeah, and, and I just think that this is, I separate the profession from the industry. And I think a lot of these changes are, are coming from the industry, not from the profession. Because the profession is slow to change. Uh, but not the industry. The industry is saying we need we need these changes. We need them now. We need them yesterday. Hmm. So um, I do think that it will happen because the um, you know it's it's happening already. Really, I mean, even the fact that Louisiana is and many other states, not just Louisiana, are accepting more online education in entry level is huge. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I, <laughs> I don't tend to go into core curriculum. It's like throwing a monkey wrench in their works. Like I've had, I've had it happen enough where I'm like, nah, I'll just keep teaching CE classes. I can't, I can't deal with the politics and drama of like talking to students in core curriculum. <laughs> My me messaging is different. 
most schools have uh, a modalities um, week or or module. Yeah. And um, and people are invited to come in. I know Christy came in and did hot bamboo massage and cupping and, and hot stove massage. Not enough for a CE class, but just enough to say to whet their appetite. So I think that uh, many schools would. And again, I'm 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 mean, I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'll take you on your offer to talk to the students via Zoom to say this is what I do. This is what I have to offer. So when you get out of class, uh, they'll they'll know the next direction they want to go with their practice. And yeah, um, there's so much marketing and advertising involved. Most of the way I've looked at it is going around the industry altogether. It's very D to C, like direct to consumer, using the internet and YouTube to just bombard social media. Because people are clothed, I film and photo document everything, and we're just getting started to really m massively releasing footage to continue building. Yeah, trying to, it, it just feels like it's trying to get massage school owners and massage facilities and massage therapists to change, and they're like, well, no, we have laws, we don't want to change, and I'm like, Okay. I mean, I thought a primary piece of the Buddha's teaching was impermanence, but okay, all right, whatever works. Well, when we did our business class, even I had a couple of people from other parts of the world come in and say hi to the students, and the students loved it. Yeah. And we all got, I mean, we sat around a, a big monitor just like this, and, and people would go on the camera and say, hey, Robert, how you doing? And um, it was a very enriching experience. So I think this kind of platform has a lot of uh, value and merit in entry-level education. Yeah, I just can't even... Like, it seems like big business like Massage Envy, their coffers are deep enough that they're going to be able to help steer regulation the way that's going to be most beneficial for their businesses. And I don't know for like standardized or generally standardized core curriculum at 500 hours, like what that means across the U.S. Are massage schools going to wound up, wind up basically putting everything online that they can possibly put online just so they can do the hands-on portion in person? Yeah, and clinics, student and clinics and stuff like that. Yeah. They won't be able to get around that. But, um, but it's still a small, only a small part of the core curriculum, yeah. usually 60 to 80 hours at max. Yeah. But um, but it's fascinating to watch things kind of change. I mean, even with the compact, uh, the interstate compact is going to, which uh, Nevada just became the first state to say yes uh, to it, is going to be 625, I think, hours. So we'll have to up our game a little bit. I, I run away from massage regulation like my ass is on fire. <laughs> I'm like, they're like, you should get involved. And I'm like, I don't want to stand that close to evil. <laughs> get it, it get involved. This <laughs> it this value. Uh, but um, there's, there's a lot of conversation going on about, you know, do we want to deregulate? Do we want to change the model? What what needs to be changed? Um, so um, stay tuned. It's going to be an interesting show. I, I have a lawyer and I avoid prison and I just go, I don't know what's going on anymore. I can't, I can't figure it out. It doesn't, doesn't make any sense to me. Um, I talked about my, uh, I, I want to teach something later beyond the mat work, which is basically like yoga therapy on steroids. It's one therapist working on like eight to 10 people in a, in a formal class where you're teaching, but using heavy, like hands on assists. And the students started going, well, what about a certification or do we need a license or, you know, and I'm like, oh my God, here we go. Yeah. The students are having some distinct problems that I don't think are body work, by the way. The body work is going swimmingly. We're teaching that. They have a, a business problem. And the business problem is they want a brand instead of a commodity. And they're like, what? And I go, hey guys, we're in Texas. You guys want to go get a hamburger? I was like, do y'all want to go to In-N-Out? And they're like, ew, I hate In-N-Out. I hate In-N-Out's fries. I'm like, so where do y'all want to get a burger? And they're like, what a burger? And I'm like, what a burger, In-N-Out, Wendy's, McDonald's, Fuddruckers, all sell a hamburger, fry, and a drink. But they're unique 
brands. Hmm. Now, what brands exist in the massage industry? And oh, like, tons. What? And I'm like, name a brand. We, did, we already have Rolfing, Traeger, Neuromuscular. Help me out here. And some of those students like don't don't really con connect on that. They'll they'll think that those are modalities. That's how they refer to it. Ah, uh, I see where you're taking and this. It's, it's like what I'm doing is I go, listen, uh, what's the difference between Nike, Reebok, and Adidas? Because athletic wear is a commodity. Shoes are a commodity. Nike, Reebok, and Adidas are brands. Right. My job is to create next level pain relief as the Rolls Royce, as the Nike in the industry. Ooh. Brand. Yeah. Brand yeah. is bigger than commodity. And here's what they've been doing. They've been selling a commodity called massage. And I go, why don't you sell a brand? And they're like, no. And I go, commodity. Massage Envy is a brand. Hand and Stone is a brand. The Woodhouse is a brand. Massage is a commodity. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's like trying to have those conversations, there's a, a business challenge. So if the student's going to do what I teach, they're flipping the model to mat based. And they go, well, my clients. And I'm like, no, no, no. If you sell the client's pain relief, the people who want pain relief will purchase that. The people who want a massage might go somewhere else. And they're afraid of offering this new service because they're, they're afraid there aren't enough clients. And I'm like, you're telling me that there aren't enough people in your community who are in pain from back pain, low back pain, knee pain, whatever kind of pain, that you can't build a practice helping people in pain? Yeah. And they're like, this is... But this is crazy. Like you're packaging this in a different way. Yes. There was never a Nike until Nike created it. <laughs> Brand does speak to people. I was like, do you guys do you guys have like a phone? They're like, ooh, my iPhone. And I'm like, it's why don't you why don't you just have an Android? I don't like yeah. that. I like my iPhone. And We're kind of like, going back to Simon Sinek's uh, talk. Yeah, it's it's like it's this this thing, and I'm, I I watch his stuff because I I occasionally go back and rewatch it because I'm trying to infuse certain concepts within what I'm giving them so that the sales process is easier, that the students just come along and stop fighting. But currently, you have to understand, 99% of the industry is table based, and I'm teaching specifically on a mat. It's not that I don't cover table work, but when I teach the table work, the students start getting on the table and then I go, you're doing mat work, you're doing mat work, you're doing mat work. <laughs> and they're like, what? And I'm like, it's not a table, it's a sky mat. Whoa, I love that. And yeah. it's like, I have to use language to try to shake them out of their torpor because they're, they're like, no, but I, I do the massage the way I was taught in school with the massage license. And you wanna go one further? I am a massage therapist. In other words, when I'm questioning that thing, they feel like, we don't like you. You're making me question who I am as a person. And I go, uh, it's 2023. It's high time we did this. <laughs> That's right. I come from a long philosophical introspective tradition. Yeah. And that's another thing with Traeger, you get on the table at a certain point. Um, so important. Uh, for body mechanics is what he teaches at. For yeah. that makes sure your body be candy because you can't trader says you cannot get what you don't honestly have yeah yeah it's a whole different mindset and i i think the profession's ready for it maybe i'm optimistic oh and that's that's the diversification hamburger frying a drink i'm like there's all these like different kinds of hamburger fries and drinks there's a million different restaurants freddy's frozen custard wendy's miss you know whatever like why can't there be different services like i'll take something like watsu which i think watsu is a trademark name why are there not watsu facilities around the u.s they're calling it uh aqua oh. stretch and uh all kinds of stuff and so and i've actually taken all three trainings in uh watsu love harold yeah. stuff. 
I mean, t to me, like... But they're rebranding it, you're right. Yeah. They're rebranding Rebranding, and like, to me, I walk into an industry that's table-based and just push the table over and go, good, now we can get started. And they're like, no, but but I, I spent like $1,000 on this really comp... I'm like, really? My training costs $7 a month. You can buy a new table if you need yeah. one later. Yeah. Why don't you use a mat? And they're like, but this is crazy. Well, you've never seen anybody do it yet. Now, the social media onslaught from people being clothed, and you continue to build, I continue to draw the 0.01% of the therapists around the U.S. who are interested in what I'm doing and become more excited, and you continue building and growing. I think that uh, some people I talk to, they're looking at marketing from that mass market saturation. They think that's where it starts, and I'm like, no, 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 no. So, uh, uh, brand, I ask the students about CrossFit. I was like, do you know anybody who does CrossFit? And they're like, yeah, they won't shut up. I'm like, do they talk about working out? Why don't they just go to Planet Fitness and work out? I'm like, no, I do CrossFit. I'm like, because CrossFit is a unique brand. They branded, we don't use air conditioning. They branded, we throw around tires because we're the badasses. I'm like, now what's that in the massage industry? What? Yeah, it's pretty funny. Mm -hmm. it, it's yeah, common. Very good way of explaining stuff. When you when you when you really sit and look at it, like across the industry, all I'm really saying is there's room for diversification, but the mainstream industry is kind of pushing back against it. And for me, it's like it's inevitable. It's if it was Terminator, this is Judgment Day. It's inevitable. Like it's going to happen one way or the other. That's a good pop culture yeah. reference. <laughs> it's like having students have the capacity to, if they want to, niche down. It's surprising to me how many students, they're very, very afraid of like breaking the massage mold. Well, I was taught I had to dress this way in school. I was taught I had to behave this way in school. You know, it's like this sort of fear-based response instead of going into the marketplace and solving a problem. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. Uh, we are um, trying to revision edu massage education, try to think about all the barriers that people have about going to massage school. And uh, one of the things that we're doing right now um, with, a, with a lady in, in Lafayette, Louisiana, is trying to start the massage we should be going to call it massage beginnings or bodywork beginnings where we just teach a nine week or nine day class give them the basics uh teach them self-care not for, not for licensure but with their appetite so they want to go to massage school but also to break the mold because maybe we need to get them and change them before they get into massage school so they're already going in with a different mindset and um i get i'm optimistic <laughs> What are you doing? <laughs> I have a subscription service. It's available to everybody on earth for seven dollars a month. I'm telling you that we need to talk. Yeah, we need to talk. I like this idea. Yeah, I mean the the barrier thing, like the uh, the class that you're teaching. I think I saw something about it online because I'm I'm following you. Is it more like for the public? Yes. It's well, we're making it inclusive. Yeah, we're we're doing a little bit of both. Um, and again, I'm 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 letting. The girl that I'm working with, I'm kind of cutting her loose, and I want to see where she takes it. Yeah. So I feel like I'm along for the ride, but I'm really enjoying what she's doing. Um, I don't want to be a Susan thing. I want to be a Christy thing, and then I'll see where she takes it. Yeah. Um, because she's got a, a different model mentally, um, and I want it to be different. I want it to be able to to to, to work and be self care for people who need it. Again, reducing barriers. And, and come up with kind of a theme for every class. That they, they, if they go to massage school, great, they've got a foundation. But we've already given them a multifaceted uh, lens to look at massage through before they even get walk in the door of massage school. And if, if it is a practitioner, a therapist already working, already licensed, to come back in and maybe refocus their lens bring them back to the roots and maybe re-energize them. That's, that's a goal for me.
Oh man, I got so many, so many things rolling through my brain. <laughs> have you have you ever heard of the time massage jam? No. So the time massage jam is an event I've run in Austin for thirteen years. It's a community bodywork event. Before COVID, I got together once a week for five hours, taught and worked with anybody who wanted it for nearly free. I receive little, if any, support from the Austin massage community, and many massage therapists actively did not like the event. Actively? What does that mean, actively did not like the event? Yeah, they probably talk shit about me behind my back. So what did you do? Just kept running the jam with the people who liked it. <laughs> Good. That's and pretty- here's what happened. People went, here's what really, really got them going. Are you ready? People would come in and nobody could tell who had a license or not. I don't understand. Are these people licensed? And I'm like, uh, I think she is. And I think she, he is. Then they're like, who are the rest of these people? And I'm like, I don't know. They just come to the jam and learn and work on each other. It's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And here's what it was. The student said, but the CE classes are too expensive. I'm like, time massage jam is nearly free. They're like, your, your sessions are too expensive. I'm like, time massage jam is nearly free. And they're like, oh, I'm like, no, your true love is complaining. Now, do you want the work or no? A little mirror there. Well, I mean, it's this thing where we've taken the time massage jam now and we're adding a partner massage class to it because I felt like people just couldn't quite wrap their brain around you know what the time massage jam was like people <laughs> people used to ask me they're like what is this I'm like it's like burning man hit massage school you are the event what well who leads this I'm like we have their leader I don't, I don't understand. And I go, I know, you'll figure it out later. (laughs) Why is it controversial to give away education freely? It's not. That's not how I felt in a very progressive hub here in Austin. Well, what you, this is so fascinating to me because what you just described is what we're, what we want to do. And we may fall flat on our face, but we're going to try. Uh, you'll probably be more successful with that than what I'm doing, but it, your stuff is probably table-based. Uh, half table, half chair. Um, it's, it's more culturally sanctioned that way. Once you go to the mat, it's like pushing the, the cultural norms aside. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, the lady who I'm doing this with does have a time massage background, so but I don't know if she's going to be doing time massage for this event. I think she wants to keep it separate and do a, a time massage class separately. But again, but I, I can't speak for her. I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's been interesting, really, really interesting over time. The, the funny thing was um, in Austin, don't get me wrong, I could find people who come to the jam and we have an active community. But the Austin Massage community generally did not support the event, nor have they. We just get a little smattering of therapists here and there, excuse me. But when I travel, I tell students about the Time Massage Jam, and they all go, Oh, I wish we had that here. And I go, So why don't you be cert- just get certified and run a Time Massage Jam yourself? And they're like, What? I'm like, I have a trademark for time massage jam and some basic certification stuff set up so you can lead your own time massage jam. They're like, oh, that sounds like work. (laughs) All right. So uh, you're, because you don't have a website, correct? I have massagepassport.com. Massagepassport.com. And then most people can contact you on Facebook or Instagram, I think you said. Facebook or Instagram. Facebook probably more prominently. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, I'm I'm pretty accessible, and I'll I'll probably shoot my uh, email address. Okay, I'm pretty old school, but I'm working on it. Um, Christy's dragging me, kicking and screaming. I'm going, but I'm slow. I tell people I'm smart, but I'm slow smart. 
Uh, when it comes to social media, just use the platforms. Once you see how other people are using it, you can see how to apply it for what you're doing. Yeah, I'm, I need to learn. Part of it's time. I, the teaching and the writing and the expert work, are just it's very time consuming. Yeah. Well, listen, we had a good conversation. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, thank you to the viewers at home. If you guys have any questions, I want to write down below if you're on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, feel free to ask us questions or uh, tag Susan if you want to uh, contact her about anything. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the program, Susan. Mm -hmm.